everyone, this is Vicki at Messy Table Studio. I'm going to make a quilled Christmas tree this morning because uh, my friend Cheryl from Arizona mentioned something about some very fancy quilling that she liked and if I was going to do it, she'd sign up for it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I just don't have time. Um, so I'm going to do a very simple quilling project that will be pertinent to Christmas this year. It's going to be a quilled Christmas tree. First, let me show you what I have. I have, uh, I think there's 10 of these, but it takes 15, so I'm just going to get started. Uh, strips of colored paper, and the color goes all the way through the paper. So if you try to do some other kinds of paper, they only, the dye or the photo or whatever you're going to use is only on the top of the paper and the color is not saturated. So the most important thing about quilling is, is when you turn a piece sideways, you see the color on the ends, which is what, what the majority of quilling is, is looking at the ends of the paper. So you want something that's color saturated all the way through the paper. I buy the majority of my quilling paper from Quilled Creations. This is leaf green, one quarter inch, six millimeters, and there's usually 50 pieces in a, um, in a package. I've been quilling for many, many years. There's certain kinds of quilling that I'm more attractive to than attracted to than others. This is one that I like. It is not my favorite, but you know, you start out doing this kind of quilling, something very simple and easy when you're a beginner. Or you can be the kind of person who prefers a different kind of quilling and start with that. This was what I learned, what I started with when I learned how to do it. So this is one of the easier forms. All right, you're going to need some kind of a tool, a slotted tool that has um, a slot right down the middle. Let me use an example, a needle that you sew with a sewing needle. Many years ago, before I started quilling, a lot of people took a wine cork and a large eyed sewing needle and glued the sewing needle into the cork, sharp side into the cork, and the eye was open. Then they would thread the paper through the eye of the needle and twist. Okay, so that's a very rudimentary way of doing it that doesn't cost you anything, especially if you drink wine and you sew. <laughs> Those are two accessible, e easy kinds of um, uh, ways to get started. I'll show you my very original, my very first quilling tool. It's got to be, geez, I don't know, 30 or 40 years old. This is what I learned on. This is like a pin. There's no slot in this tool. This is the purest quilling lover's tool. There is no slot in the tool. I also learned to quill on a toothpick. It's a little tricky, but it does work. Um, this quilling tool has a little snagged edge on the end that you can barely see. You can feel it because it leaves an indentation in your finger, right? It is there. And what you would do, you would kind of wet the end of the piece of paper, lay it down on your finger, and make it wrap around here, and then you would roll as best you could and yes stuff sprung forth and unraveled and you'd have to start over. There's downsides to starting over which I will show you in a minute. Okay so let's get started on the Christmas tree. You need saturated color paper. Um, this is a quilling board from Quill Creations. It's their newest one. I had a different one. It's flat on the back. I think I've done quilling videos in the past where I've talked about this but this has holes in it, and they're there for a reason. If you do not have a quilling board, you can, can um, trace something on a piece of chipboard or cardboard and lay that flat, and then you can put your coil inside here, which will keep it from getting bigger than what you actually want it. All right, so I'm going to use large pieces here because they're easy to work with for a beginner. The first thing you want to do is if you take a lot of uh, quilling paper off, you want to rip the ends because all the ends are glued together and you don't want that glue in your stuff. So you just rip it off. 
Plus, having a frayed end on your quilling glues much better than if you take scissors and cut them blunt off. Because what you don't see is there are tiny fibers sticking out on the ends that will lay down flat, lay down nicely when you glue your when you glue, you know, in a circle and this is on the outside of your work, it will lay down nicer and look less intrusive than if you took scissors and cut a blunt cut. All right, Ew, let's see. So you take one piece of quilling paper and there is a wrong side and a right side. The wrong side is, let me see, let me look at this. This, sometimes you can feel it, sometimes you can see it. And I'm basically recording in the dark here, so it's kind of hard for me to see the wrong and right. All right, I'm just going to assume this is the right side. So you put your paper in the slot, your slotted tool of your choice. There are a thousand different quilling tools. You know, you can also use quilling tools to make paper beads with. It's a little different looking tool, but you get almost the exact same results. All right, so you can either turn towards you, I mean away from you, or you can turn towards you. The object is to keep the paper taut and just roll and roll. These strips, I think, are between 12 and 15 inches long. I mean, maybe 15 to 17. I can't remember how long they are. All right, so we're getting to the end. And don't let go, because you'll have to start all over and it ruins your, it, I'll show you. All right, so you have this frayed edge here, but we're not concerned with that. You're going to pull this out. Then you're going to lay this in the circle that you made. And I can't remember which ones I used. I think I used, which one did I use? A two. All right, these are numbered large to small. You take it and it's going to want to unwind. And the fact that your, um, this has depth to it, that's why I told you you could get a piece of cardboard and poke a hole, uh, cut a hole in it. When you lay it down flat, the depth of the cardboard is what holds this little unwindy monster in its place. Once it's unwound, you mean you can do all these, see, look, I touched it, and now it's gonna unwind. Um, so now I have ruined my coil. This is called a coil. I ruined my coil by touching it. You can redo it, but the results will not be as good as the first time you did it because the paper gets fatigued, just like metal fatigue. Paper has a fatigue point also. Right, so I'm rolling, rolling again. Once you put it in there, don't touch it again until you have to glue it. Just leave it alone. I don't know if this will spring. Yep, there we go. All right, so now, oh, did it again. Son of a gun. You want your coil to be evenly spaced. And if it's not, your stuff does not look consistent. Let me see if I can get it in here. Sometimes you can put it back in there. Sometimes it... You can't put the horse back in the barn. All right, so I'm gonna take this, and this is my frayed edge. The least amount of glue you use is the best amount of glue. So some people will put glue on a little piece of paper, put it next to where they are, and then take a toothpick or a pin and kind of dab it on there. You don't want to see a glue mess. So. You take this and you hold it, kind of brush it down, and the fibers kind of melt into the outside. Now this is a little bit smaller than it should be, but I think it'll work. All right, let's try that again. This time, hopefully, we'll get it right. All right, that is the, well, it's two pieces. I guess that's why I can't see it. This is the wrong side. This is the right side. When a paper cutter, these are, long sheets of paper. That's what they cut the strips from. So when the paper cutter goes down like this onto the paper, it leaves a mark uh, 
it pushes the paper down and so that leaves like a little bit of an elevated edge on either side of the paper. That is considered to be the wrong side of the quilling paper. The side where you can't see where it's mashed down the paper is the proper side, the right side. All right, I put it through the slotted tool and now I'm just gonna roll between my thumb and my finger until I get it into what's called a peg. A peg is a very solid roll piece of paper. It looks like this. This is a this is a peg. All right. So you take the peg, you put it inside here, and it's going to uncoil. And once it's uncoiled, it's just called a coil. Hopefully that will stay in there. There you go. All right. It's come. Yep. That's it. All right. Okay. So I'm going to pull a little bit of the edge in. Put a teeny bit of glue. Wrap it around and press it down. And that should fit inside. There, there you go. So there's two, and this one is number three. So let me show you how to make this for the tree. You don't want the glued edge to show in your project. So if you know you're going to glue things side by side, try to put your raw edges next to each other so you can't see them. So, in order to make this look like a teardrop, I'm going to take the raw edge and put it on the side. I'm going to pull the inner circles down with my finger and see how it looks. And then I'm going to pinch the top. And the rest of it makes this really cool design that goes around. The raw edge is on the side, you're not going to see it when you glue things together. When you do this project, you're going to take one this way and one this way and glue them together. Let's see, where's my raw edge? It'll be on this side. There we go. So I want to glue my raw edge. Where's the raw edge on this one? See, uh, the light is very dim in here. There it is. There's the raw edge. So I want to take the raw edge and glue a raw edge to a raw edge. It's that simple. You need 15 of these, and as soon as I do 15, I'll be back. So they're all pinched. You have to start with five on the bottom. So this is what you do. You take this one and you glue a little bit where these two are going to touch. My glue is drying over. I love these little tiny glue things, but they do get a mind of their own. So I'm going to put the glue here because they touch and I use too much glue. So let me dab a little around. So I don't want it to show when it dries. And I'm going to stick a pin. Now, the, the pinning is, uh, I guess that's a preferred method. I want to pin this in between the pieces of paper in here so that it doesn't move while it's drying. So I'll pin one at the bottom and one at the top. And that will give it stability while I, pin, while I glue the other things in on, on. There's an open gap there. I don't care that it's there. I just want to make sure 
this does not wiggle around too much. All right, so the next one, make sure all your paper is leaning one direction. Here's the next one. All right, some people will take saran wrap, plastic wrap, whatever you've got and line this with it so the glue doesn't stick to the cork board. I don't have any glue bottoms on mine. When you do another kind of quilling, you're gluing the very bottom, like the paper's turned this way, you're gluing this to make the paper stand upright. So that means glue will be all over the place. So you don't want to do that on your cork board because essentially you're gluing your piece, uh, your artwork onto the cork board. So you need some kind of a plastic wrap. All right. Hmm. Okay. My the word the enemy of of my quilling is my ability to overuse glue. And put a little pen here. Put another one at the top. And my paper leans this way, so I need to do it on the inside. Then you're going to do the next layer, where you kind of squeeze this in between the two above. So your glue is going to be basically at the tips of these two bottoms here. Yeah, the, the two bottom pieces. Then you're going to wedge this in there. You don't have to ram it down there because it's not going to fit in there completely. So don't ram it in too deep. Again, you'll need a little pin. That's why I suggest you buy a big old box. <laughs> All right, this is going left. I'll put a little glue on both sides here instead of trying to see it on there because the lighting in here is terrible. All right, so we're going to push this in there just a little bit, make them stand straight up. Put a pin at the bottom and a pin at the top. And I'm going to pinch it a little bit better because I think it looks nicer that way. There. And this is going left. I'm going to put it in there. Whatever kind of glue you buy, be sure you buy glue that dries white. I mean, dries clear. So you, if you overuse glue, like I've done a little bit right in here, you won't. It won't look unsightly unless you just get crazy with the glue, which has ruined many of my quilling projects. I don't mind it, but purists definitely mind. All right, there's the second layer. I'm gonna pin again. You're only using the pins to make sure that it gets good glue adherence. And we're gonna do every row that way. Let's see, it's left. It's had time to drive, so let me set this aside and show you the next part. Now, I'm not a pack rat, <laughs> per se, but 
when I spend time doing things, I like to save them for future uses when I know I will come back to them. This is something that I come back to lots to look for one or two small pieces that will fit my needs. These are coils and marquees and teardrops, all kinds of stuff in here. But these guys are the ones that I'm looking for. These are called pegs. Remember I told you about pegs? Very small, rolled up, tight pieces of paper. So let me move this out of the way. And I'm going to pour these on here so I can see the height. It's hard to know the depth, the height of these things until you kind of spread them out and take a look at them. I need something that's skinny. I need a pair of tweezers for this. If you buy a kit of, of quilling things, a lot of times they will come with a, par, a pair of nice sharp, this is from Quilled Creations, uh, nice sharp tweezers, and I really love these tweezers. I don't use them just for quilling. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put this down on top of this, and I'm going to pull the pins out. And the reason I'm doing that is in case it's not quite dry enough. I don't want to pull everything out in a hasty manner and ruined all this stuff. So I try to put, lay the tweezers flat down where I can so I can pull pins without making a big old mess. It takes a couple seconds and yes, it can be a little tedious, but your end results will be much better if you don't undo what you just got done gluing. I think this is pretty dry, but I just don't trust something not to pop out. So I want to do it as neatly as possible without a disaster. That one came out. Ooh. All right, so there's your Christmas tree. Well, most of it. All right, so what you need to do is, you see these gaps in between where you didn't ram it down in there? You're going to fill those with different colors. Now, some of these pegs are better than others, and they might not, yeah, yeah, that's a little too tight for that one. These might not fit in here, but I'm going to try. So you take these. Now uh, this one is too short to fit in here. Let me get pick it out again. So I would need the same height of paper, a quarter inch paper for this, but I'm not going to do that because I want to use this stuff up and I don't want to drag out 15 different colors of paper to do this with. This was supposed to be a simple project and I don't want to make it complicated especially for anyone who's a beginner. So what I'm going to do is, let's see, that's very tiny, that's too small. I need something that's that's a little bit fuller. Maybe this, I think this one will work. So I'm going to take this and put a little bit of glue on one side and a little bit of glue on the other. Whoops, and then I'm gonna drop it on the board. <laughs> Take this. Arr. I don't wanna stick the tweezers in the glue. And then I'm gonna find a nice spot for it and I'm just kinda, I'm gonna hold it up a little bit. I don't want it to go down in the bottom because like I said, this is too short to really be used to be used in here, but I don't want to waste my paper. And so I'm going to take a little here, and I'm just going to look for pieces that I can poke in there. If you have lots of quilling paper, then you will probably have one quarter inch of like every color they've got that you like, and you probably will have plenty of pieces. You messed up on something else that will fit the bill, and that's not tight enough. 
And this one here. You can do beads. You can do little quilled pegs. You can do anything you like in between. Let's see, what do we got here? Beep -bidee, bidee -bidee. I do want a red one, here's one. These are so tiny. These pieces, I think, are an eighth of an inch in height. These were a quarter of an inch, this is an eighth of an inch. And they do make paper smaller than that. That's like a thread for very delicate quilling. Smaller stuff. All right, so I need to find something that this little teeny peg will fit in because this is not a very fat peg. Let us see what we can do here. I think that is too, too open a space, but because I put the glue where I did, I think I can get it to stay. This is a yellow, but the inside of this one is too large. Mm, let's see, I got a purple one here. Well, too large on the inside. Um, what's this one? I think this is white. Do I want white on my tree? No. Oops. Okay, I may have to wind up some scraps. Um, I save my scrap ends and I put them back in the bags. Like, if I only use half of one of these pieces here, I take it and I shove it back down in the bag so I know what size it is. But look, when you start doing this, you'll know the sizes just by looking at them. Um, and then I slip it back down here so I can save it for another time. I don't think there's too many more of these pegs that I can use in here that aren't... Chris, I can't use any more of these because there's no Christmas colors. Or they have too much of a gap in the middle from winding. That one's too fat. And the rest are weird colors. I don't know if I want to use weird colors or not. Well, fooey. All right, let me go look at my scraps. All right, here's a scrap bag. All these pieces in here came from a project that I saved all the paper from it. This is a different company from Quill Creations. This is one eighth of an inch paper. But there's plenty in here that I can roll some of these colors, like these yellows. I got any that are already undone. No. All right. Let me pull the yellow out. All right. So this was part of, like I said, another project, and they put all the colors together in the same group like this. There's blue and yellow. I don't want the blue. I only want the yellow. So I'm going to take this, fold it in half, rip it. Rip it good. Okay. Peel the end off of it. I see this is the wrong side, this is the right side. And I'm going to make a peg. I'm going to rip it again. I probably could have used a quarter of a piece. I'm going to glue it on the end. glue it on two sides. Take it off. And this may even be still a little too fat for what I want, but I do have some more open spaces. Here we go. I'm going to take that and put it in there, but I'm not ramming all the way to the bottom. Remember, this is only a quarter of an inch, so this is like half the size of that stuff. Um, let's see. I have lots of miscellaneous pieces in here. How about a piece of green? I have lots of white. Well, let's use some white. This is why you don't throw anything away when you're doing this kind of hobby, because there may come a time that you need a teeny weeny piece to fill a teeny weeny spot, and you don't want to throw it away. All right, let me roll it this way, because it's, well, I thought it was flat on one end, but they, they've both been torn.
I don't know what company's paper I'm using. I'd plug them except for I don't have the top of the label anymore. Sometimes when you pull this, the inside pops out. This one's rather fat. Do I have any fat spots in here I could fill? Nope. I overwhelmed this. So this was too large of a piece. And this will go in there with the rest of these other little doodahs here. Um, let's see, what other colors do we have? Maybe I ought to stick with yellow since I have so much of it here. Oh, let me do yellow. All right, there's a fourth of a um, piece of paper. This one's half. Let's roll this and see what we get. I don't want another fat one, which is exactly what I got, but it might fill this spot or this spot because it's a little fat like this one is. I'm looking for large places, and I really don't want to put next to another yellow again, but... Might do it anyway. Here's a spot. And if this is... See, this is still too fat, so I guess it's going to have to be an eighth. All right, I'm going to take this. Whoops. That still seems a little too small, but we'll give it a try. Yeah, it's very small. All right. So. We'll see. I'm gonna have to go fish around and find something else. Bing, bing, bing. Let's do a yellow one down here on the bottom. Oh, good enough. There's another yellow one. All right, so it would take an eighth of this kind of strip. Let's try. I'm dark here. Let's try dark red. Or, ugh, this one maroon. That's kind of If you have too much glue sometimes, glue, sometimes you can just roll it between your fingers and eventually it holds. Make sure that your top and bottom are flat. Then I'm going to put the tweezers through a little tiny hole. Dab a little bit of glue. And put it right here. Now, the, the person who did this original, I think they took larger paper than what I'm using and put it in there. But I'm still hopeful I can find something. Pink? Do I really want pink on my Christmas tree? Me? No, not really. What color is this? Is that gray or light blue? I Honestly, the light's so low in here, I can't tell what color it is. 
Yeah, good enough. I want to use up some of my scraps. I'll show you a project where I use up my scraps, and I've shown this on here before, but for the new people. Let's put this here. There you go. So I need one, two, huh, just two more. Well, I don't really want a blue blue on my Christmas tree, but I guess I could. I won't hurt anything, will it? So I'm just going to pull off an estimated piece. Remember, tear, don't cut. That's the back side. This is the front side. There are two more parts to this. I'm going to do one but not the other because I don't happen to like the, um, they put like a wood looking piece here at the bottom. I really don't want my Christmas tree to have that. But I'll show you how you can do it. All right. So this again is from Quill Creations. These are called Jewel Tones. This is the only yellows that I have that are a quarter of an inch. So I am going to use it. All right. What you're going to make now, or we're going to make now, see it moves because the glue wasn't too excessive for the bottom, the back. All right, so I'm going to take this yellow jewel tone and I'm going to make a star to put on top. Now I'm not sure how many inches I need. I'm not gonna measure, because uh, frankly, this is just impromptu and I don't really care. <laughs> All right, so I just put whatever excess piece I had. This has already been torn and I just tore this end. Make sure your ridges are on the back side of your quilling paper. That is the wrong side of the quilling paper. I'm going to take this. Remember how we rolled up this other stuff? Everything starts with rolling something. A peg, a coil. Everything starts basically with a coil. All right, so I need to flip this board over for a second. And here's our little compartments here. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to put it in the two and let it unwind on its own. See, it's it's unwinding. And if you shake it sometimes a little, you can conform it into that area. I'm going to take it out gingerly. Get some glue. This looks like very shiny ribbon. I'm going to mash down on there because I have too much glue. Let me just kind of Mush that away. I think this might be too small for what I've got, but I'm going to use it. All right, we have to wait for the glue to dry for a second. All right, we're going to make a. Whoops! Because this is shiny metallic paper, I think the glue does not adhere as well as cotton-based, like what this stuff is. You might have to press down on it. Okay, so we're going to make a star. So basically what you're going to do, you're going to make a box. So you're going to squeeze this way a little bit. Then you're going to turn it this way and squeeze some more. And then squeeze and squeeze till you get a square. All right, that's a square. Then you're going to take your square and you're going to pinch and indent your thumb in the middle here and squeeze and pinch and squeeze and pinch and squeeze and pinch until you get the desired look. All 
If you want something more pointy, you gotta squeeze a little more. You're gonna need a couple pens. Because the last part's a little tricky. Um, I'm gonna take glue and put it right here on the end. And this is definitely tricky, and you're gonna have to let it dry for a while. Put it at the end of your Christmas tree for your star and pin it. And I put my pins away. Pin here close so it mashes. Pin here so you put some force to force it to stick here in between. And then because you don't want it flopping around on the board, just put one pin there. So there is your Christmas tree with a star. Let me let it dry and we'll lift it off the board in a second. Okay, it's been a few minutes since I pinned this. May not stick, may not stay. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> Look at that. So there's your Christmas tree with a star on top. If you want to hang it, I suggest you use a very light thread like sewing thread or that metallic stuff that's very thin that you can thread through some of the openings here in the star. I wouldn't pull and tug on it too much because this is on there precariously, so be gentle with it. This would make a great ornament for a Christmas card, but when you mail it, you need to put padding so it's going to cost you more to send it. Or if you want to give a local person a lovely gift, this would be perfect because it's so small and it's pretty quick and easy. Not, not a lot required to make it. So there you are, a quilled Christmas tree. Yay! I'm sorry it's before Thanksgiving. <laughs> there was one more thing I wanted to show you guys before I go. Remember all those little bits and pieces I have in these little boxes? Where did I put the boxes? This kind of stuff. I have a couple others. Wait. I have a couple others that have bigger pieces in them. The reason you save them is so that you can make this. I've showed this in past videos, but what I did with this is I took a little bowl, put saran wrap over it, and tucked it inside the bowl. Then I started finding miscellaneous pieces, and I would glue a couple together. Now, I didn't glue them to the saran wrap or the plastic wrap. I just glued each of them to each other. And eventually, it got to be so much that I could go around the corners. And there's the inside. Now, I did shellac it. You can hear. <laughs> These were miscellaneous pieces, pieces that I had in a little box. This is why you never throw away your excess pieces. Because you can always use them um, in something else. To make something else. And this was super duper easy. It took me probably about a week to do this because I was working on quilling, pro quilling projects and I wanted to make sure that I could finish my project and whatever was left over, then I, I used in here. Sometimes I did have to roll some extra pieces because I didn't have enough to fill in the gaps, like these little tiny ones, like this, that I used on the Christmas tree. I could have used could have used. Um, <laughs> I did have to fill in some gaps, but overall, it's it's bloody strong, and I just love this little bowl. I made a couple other things since then that are like this and have given them away, but I just thought, why waste all that time you put into rolling these and your money and save them? Now, I will say, the majority of these are made out of three-eighths of an inch size paper. So they have five-eighths, three-eighths, one-eighth, 
and then there is very thin paper. Let me show you the other stuff. Okay, so this is, I think this is the world's tiniest paper. I think it is Chinese. I can't remember. All right, so they give you all their colors on the back. Where is this paper? It's Japanese quilling paper, sorry. Ooh, I'm so sorry. All right, this is the thinnest paper I've ever seen for quilling. Look how skinny that is. You almost can't see it, it's so skinny. Compared to this. That's a quarter of an inch. I think this is the uh, 16th of an inch size paper. It's it's very skinny, and I'll show you what I do with it. As soon as I cram this paper back into this container. I can't remember how I found this stuff. I saw somebody do something with it on the internet, and then I think I went to Amazon and ordered it. Not cheap paper. Alright, so here is what I make with it. These are orchids. These are quilled orchids. Let me get this off the table. Maybe it'll focus better. There we go. That is a quilled orchid. All right, let me show you the other one. And this is also a quilled orchid. Sideways. There you go. So I don't like doing the flat kind of quilling. I mean, doing the Christmas tree was fun. It's okay. But my favorite kind of quilling is 3D quilling. I, I love making these things. They're very tedious. There's a lot of little parts. But the end result, to me, is just phenomenal. So there you go for a quickie quilled Christmas thing, ornament, gift, card front, whatever you want it to be. Thank you, everybody, for stopping by. I appreciate it, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.